why did I stop my fasting protocol? One of the biggest things I've changed my mind on over the past few years is um, my stance on meal skipping. Why has Peter Atia and Rhonda Patrick, who are both famous doctors in the longevity space, changed their position on fasting? And how should we approach fasting based on the latest human research to optimize our health? We need to get this right because if we don't, it can take years off our lifespan. This topic can be confusing. So in this video, I'll be breaking it down in simple terms, giving you the pros and cons of meal skipping so that you know what to look out for. And I'll give you a clear plan on how to approach fasting in case you decide it's worth it for you. Now, you've probably heard great things about intermittent fasting. So what's caused this shift in Dr. Atiyah's and Dr. Patrick's approach? Well, the initial excitement for intermittent fasting, it came from studies in rodents, which reported that time-restricted feeding or eating within a small window in the day reduced body weight, improved blood sugar control, lowers insulin levels, and increases lifespan. And here is the critical point, even when food intake is matched to the control group. So we know from previous rodent studies that restricting calories extends rodent lifespan. But here in the time-restricted feeding studies, even when both groups of rodents were eating the same amount of food, the rodents who ate the food within that smaller time frame in the day were living longer. That led to an explosion in popularity of time-restricted feeding, where even if you don't need to lose weight, it was hoped that if humans also ate within that smaller time frame in the day, we too could live longer and healthier. So how was it thought that time-restricted feeding could offer these benefits? Well, when rodents were fasting for a period of time during the day, scientists took biopsies and they saw that a process called autophagy was occurring in the cells of these mice. So autophagy is the cell clearance process where old damaged components are flushed away and then new components can be built. It sounds wonderful, but we are not rodents. What did the human clinical trials show? And as more research came through, that led to Dr. Peter Atia and Dr. Rhonda Patrick to shift their position. At first, the research in humans looked promising. For example, a 2020 meta-analysis of the human studies suggested that time-restricted feeding offered greater weight loss and reductions in blood sugar levels compared to other diets where people could eat whenever they wanted. So it all sounds wonderful, but when we dig deeper, we find a big problem. Most of the studies that were done on time-restricted feeding have a fatal flaw. The time-restricted feeding groups, they ate less calories compared to the control group. Now, this isn't the problem that led Dr. Atia and Dr. Patrick to change their position. That's coming soon, but it's important that we finish off this thread. Remember, it was hoped that time-restricted feeding would offer benefits beyond simply restricting calories. That's what the rodent study suggested. But when the Cochrane organization performed a meta-analysis in 2021, where they combined all of the relevant clinical studies together, they found that the trials that matched the calorie intake between both groups, there were no differences in weight loss or blood sugar levels. Even studies that aimed to calorie match the diet groups struggled. Take for example this 2019 study which concluded that alternate day fasting may produce greater reductions in fasting insulin and insulin resistance versus calorie restriction. But when you actually look at the data and explore how many calories both groups ate, the fasting group still ate less calories compared to the calorie restriction group. So it was the lower calorie intake that offered those benefits. It didn't seem to have anything to do with the fasting itself. And it's the same for fatty liver. There appear to be no further benefits from time-restricted feeding beyond calorie restriction. And to put another nail in the coffin, a new time-restricted feeding study was recently published. Both groups ate the same amount of calories, but one group ate within a 10-hour window and ate 80% of their food before 1pm, while the other group ate in a usual eating pattern and had over 50% of their food after 5 p.m. Overall, there were no differences in weight loss or blood sugar levels between the two groups, suggesting that any effect that time-restricted feeding had on weight is due to reductions in calorie intake. But isn't restricting calories a good thing? Should we use time-restricted feeding to reduce our food intake? Yes, but here is where the confusion comes in, and this is why Dr. Atia, Dr. Patrick, and my previous fasting videos tried to add nuance to this topic. Controlling calorie intake is great, but we need to be mindful about protein. To maximize the benefits of resistance exercise and to support muscle building, we want 1.6 grams of protein intake per kilogram of lean body weight per day. So if someone is completely skipping meals, it can be quite difficult to reach those protein targets. For example, often when people practice time-restricted feeding, they skip breakfast and only eat in the afternoon and evening. That can be great for restricting calories, but not so great for protein intake. 
Instead, if someone wants to have their main meals in the afternoon and evening to restrict their overall calorie intake, one option would be to include a low-calorie protein shake in the morning. We don't need to worry about so-called breaking a fast because we know it's not the fasting itself that offers the benefits, it's the overall reduction in calorie intake. But what if we take fasting a step further and perform multi-day fasts? In theory, fasting for multiple days in a row should powerfully activate autophagy and provide the benefits that we see in the rodent studies. This is actually the strategy that I used to do about three to four years ago, where every three months I would do a water fast for seven days. Now, what's the justification for this? Well, a rat hour is very different to a human hour. Rats have a metabolic rate of roughly 6.4 times that of humans. So a rat Rat fasting for 16 hours is roughly the equivalent of a human fasting for four days. Now this is a very crude method, but it likely explains why humans don't appear to get any additional benefit from time restricted feeding beyond calorie restriction, whereas rats do. Especially when you consider that in humans, our liver stores energy in the form of glycogen, and it can take up to 48 hours to burn through those glycogen stores before autophagy really kicks in. Now I want to be clear that this is speculation, and it's based on mechanistic reasoning, but it's the justification provided for multi-day fasts. But I stopped doing these prolonged fasts because of two reasons. The first is that there's no good human evidence that this is beneficial in the long term, or the extent that autophagy is being activated. But the second and probably more important reason is muscle loss. So every day we break down muscle, and if we don't rebuild that lost muscle, we're in a net loss and we lose strength. Any potential benefit I was receiving from these prolonged fasts, they were vastly outweighed by the negative impact on my muscle stores, similar to what happened to Dr. Atia. You may ask the question, why did I stop my fasting protocol? It's very difficult to gain back the lean muscle you keep losing. So let's try now and pull everything together. There's no benefit from time-restricted feeding beyond calorie restriction. That's what the human clinical research suggests to us today. Calorie restriction is great for weight loss and to treat diabetes. So in my clinic, I frequently advise my patients who want to lose weight or to reduce their blood sugar levels to consider time-restricted feeding. But I encourage them to also use a low-calorie protein shake during the part of the day where they're fasting. This is to make sure that they're getting enough protein to look after their muscles. I advise this because it's not that something magical is happening to the body during these skipped meals or that we're activating autophagy. It's the calorie restriction that's doing the trick. Some patients want to eat their meals in the afternoon, in which case I advise that they have a low calorie protein shake in the morning. Others want to eat their meals in the morning, in which case they'll have that protein shake in the afternoon and evening. For me personally, I feel best when I have a large breakfast, a medium lunch, and a small early dinner. After dinner, I wait 30 minutes and then I brush my teeth. That's a powerful signal that I've finished eating for the day. And by using the strategy, I make sure that when I'm sleeping, my body is diverting resources to repair rather than digestion. It's actually quite an interesting experiment to run. If you have a smartwatch, measure your heart rate overnight and compare what happens when you have a large late dinner compared to an early light dinner. Your heart rate will be much lower if you have an early light dinner, and the vast majority of people wake up with a lot more energy. Finally, I advise my patients against multi-day fasts due to the impact on their muscle stores. Muscle is far too important to have it waste away. And I've spoken a lot about protein during this video, but I've only scratched the surface. So I highly recommend that you check out this next video here, where I go into detail about protein intake and the best strategies to optimize protein intake for our health. And a massive thank you to all of the Patreons supporting the channel.